This pond is so remarkable for its depth and purity as to merit a particular description. It is a clear and deep green well, half a mile long and a mile and three quarters in circumference, and contains about 61 and a half acres. A perennial spring in the midst of pine and oak woods, without any visible inlet or outlet, except by the clouds and evaporation. Walden is blue at one time, and green at another, even from the same point of view. Lying between the earth and the heavens, it partakes of the color of both. Water is so transparent that the bottom can be discerned at the depth of 25 or 30 feet. Paddling over it, you may see many feet beneath the surface, the schools of perch and shiners. The shore is composed of a belt of smooth, rounded white stones, like paving stones, excepting one or two short sand beaches, and is so steep that in many places, a single leap will carry you into water over your head. And were it not for its remarkable transparency, that would be the last to be seen of its bottom till it rose on the opposite side. Some think it is bottomless. Perhaps on that spring morning when Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden, Walden Pond was already in existence, and even then, Breaking up in a gentle spring rain accompanied with mist and a southerly wind and covered with myriads of ducks and geese. The pond rises and falls, but whether regularly or not, and within what period, nobody knows. <laughs> or as usual, many pretend to know. This Rise and fall of Walden at long intervals serves this use at least. The water, standing at this great height for a year or more, though it makes it difficult to walk around it, kills the shrubs and trees which have sprung up about its edge since the last rise. Pitch pines, birches, alders, aspens and others. And falling again leaves an unobstructed shore. For unlike many ponds, and all waters, which are subjected to a daily tide, its shore is cleanest when the water is lowest. Some have been puzzled to tell how the shore became so regularly paved. My townsmen have all heard the tradition that anciently the Indians were holding a powwow upon a hill here which rose as high into the heavens as the pond now sinks deep into the earth. And they used much profanity as the story goes, though this vice is one of which the Indians were never guilty. And while they were thus engaged, the hill shook and suddenly sank, and only one old squaw named Walden escaped. And from her, the pond was named. When the hill shook, these stones rolled down its side and became the present shore. A lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. It is Earth's eye, looking into which the beholder measures the depth of his own nature. The fluviatil trees next the shore are the slender eyelashes which fringe it, and the wooded hills and cliffs around are its overhanging brows. Standing on the smooth, sandy beach at the east end of the pond in a calm September afternoon, whence came the expression, the glassy surface of the lake, it is like molten glass, cooled but not congealed, and the few motes in it are pure and beautiful, like the imperfections in glass. In September or October, Walden is a perfect forest mirror, 
sky water. It needs no offense. Nations come and go without defiling it. The individual comes first. The individual is primary. The autonomy of the individual is the natural state of the individual. This is where Henry David Thoreau plugs into our story. Thoreau is a liberal critic of a developing liberal society and in some sense helps to demonstrate the limits of liberalism at least in so far as community or social organization is concerned. But before we get to that, let's take a look at Thoreau himself. His background led him to the specific posture that I just described and that will develop in the remainder of this lecture. He was born after the War of 1812, educated at Harvard, and he was a teacher by profession. But he lasted as a teacher only a few months because the school in which he taught required teachers to use corporal punishment. And he refused to strike a child, a student. The community wanted him to. He said he couldn't. It violated his conscience, and so he left the teaching profession and then essentially became a writer. Now, in the process of this, he gravitated to transcendentalism. And his guru, if you were, is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Transcendentalism is extraordinarily complex, multifaceted, and very difficult to summarize quickly. So I am going to summarize it quickly, realizing that this summary is is thin at best. In general, it's a movement that arose in reaction against materialism and egalitarianism and rationalism. Some people put it in the context of the romantic reaction of the 19th century to the Enlightenment. It rejected to some degree urban lifestyle holding them to be out of sync with nature, removing man from his element. This removal from nature created a sort of perverse human nature. It changed people. It made them rational and calculating, made them more dependent on other people, less reliant upon themselves, more social than individual, more constructed and artificial, and less natural and organic. Now, conjoined with democratization, this urbanization, along with democratization, majority rule, egalitarianism, was potentially deadly to individuals. Majority rule is coercive. Transcendentalism stressed self-reliance, self-development in harmony with nature, and rejection of traditional sources of authority, whether they come from the one, the few, or the many. The truth is something the individual seeks through a development of the whole person and not just part of the person. Thoreau's literary works grew out of this intellectual tradition. In fact, Walden, which was published in 1854, is an ode to the simple life, living in concert with nature. In this instance, nature was a plot of land that Ralph Waldo Emerson owned outside of Boston. Um, Thoreau built a cabin there, and he wore homespun clothing while he was there. But it was Emerson's property, and it wasn't particularly far outside of Boston. In fact, Thoreau used to walk to his mother's house for dinner on most Sundays. So he's not out in the middle of the wilderness, but he's not living in Boston either. Walden extols the virtues of nature and living the transcendent life in nature. His essay on civil disobedience is what we'll look at here. 
This isn't to say that Walden isn't important. It influences environmental movements over time, Roosevelt and the like. But civil disobedience really contains the crux of Thoreau's political statement. Now realize that transcendentalism as a political philosophy really didn't have much traction. It wasn't concerned with the political, it wasn't really concerned with the social, it was concerned with the individual reinventing him or herself. There are, however, political implications that grow out of Thoreau's transcendentalism because of the strong moral attachments he had, in particular his opposition to slavery. That is the context in which civil disobedience 